Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My grass man sightings happened in Hawking County, and they started in about 2017, it was spring. A buddy of mine and me, we had been hearing them down at his cabin. And um, it's in a campground, and we've been hearing the grass man, the dreaded Ohio howl, the famous one we was hearing, I mean, that exact same howl. And we would hear it two or three times a night, and we got pretty excited about it. And um, we uh, were setting out on his deck one night, listening like we always did. I'd get down probably maybe once or twice a week, and we just sat out to the wee hours on the deck listening and talking a little bit and drinking coffee. And um, one night we, we had heard the grass man and, and we had heard coyotes. Now it's, it sounds like they're rounding them up. Cause I mean, this, this campground is, is a big campground. It's got like eight miles of road in it and it has on the outskirts is nothing but woods. I mean, just every direction. And one, the one highway runs down by there, and then they go off to a side road and you're into the campground. So we're setting out, listening to all the sounds and just kind of looking around. And then across the valley, we see a big shadow. And all of a sudden, it comes out into the light on the adjacent property. Now, mind you, this, this is a, um, actually, I was wrong when I said spring. This was actually in the winter time. They got my signals crossed up there. This was actually happened in the winter because there was nobody hardly in the campgrounds, just him. And I think there was like maybe five other people scattered out in the campgrounds. And one of them was across the valley. And this guy was a truck driver. So he'd only there once in a while, but he had a security light and the security light almost never comes on for anything except when he's out there. Well, this time it came on. And that's when we saw the big shadow. And then all of a sudden, this grass man steps out into the light. And he, he's, I, I mean, you know, it, it's hard to tell how tall he was from the distance we were at, but we could see him quite well. And we could see that he was big. You could see that he was hair covered. He was that typical cone head, no neck, broad shoulders, just big, beefy um creature you know and so we're just mesmerized by this thing watching it trying to figure out what it's doing because it's just kind of back and forth but it's like trying to keep the security light on or something that's what we were you know trying to figure it because it wasn't really moving anywhere it would just stand in that one spot swaying so we're watching this thing trying to figure out what it's doing and, and like I said, we didn't get a lot of detail other than the cone head and the, the body build in the long, long arms. And the next thing we know, another one came out and came right over to it. And now they're both standing there swaying. And, and we were to this day, we didn't know what they were looking at, but we were just watching them sway back and forth. And the second one was about the same size. Uh, roughly the same build. I mean, it was uh, just two cookie cutter individuals, like they were from the same mold. But they, it was just really weird. We couldn't figure out what they were looking at, what they were actually doing. And then finally, they just turned and walked off, which, like I said, <laughs> that one was really bizarre. We had had a couple like that where we'd been sitting on the deck and they would just come out, you know, in, in that same 
pretty much that same area that we'd see that once we'd see that security light come on, we'd get all excited because we knew, hey, they're going to come out. And we go out and watch him from his deck. And that got to be a habit. We didn't, we didn't see him all the time. You know, it wasn't like every day or anything like that, but it was just on occasion, like maybe once or twice after the initial one. And um, they got to a point where there was a youth that actually would follow my buddy around as he was doing his everyday routines at the campground. I mean, you, you kind of got to picture this, this campground. Everybody has a golf cart. We ride around in golf carts. And in the winter, when there's nobody there, he still goes and keeps an eye on other people's lots and stuff like that. He was actually a director for a while at the time in the campground. And people would sneak in and try to steal stuff from cabins. So he would go around and check this stuff out, make sure nobody was in there that shouldn't be in there. And in the process, he got to noticing that this youth was following him around. It would stay about 30 yards away from him, and it would always stay behind trees, behind cabins. Just, you know, he would just see it peeking out. And he told me about this. So I went down, and sure enough, we went up. We go up on the hill because he's right, right in the middle of the hill. Uh, from the bottom to so the, you know, it's a big valley. And then he's part way up the hill. And then at the top of the hill is where we go up to get cell service. And there's a big water tank up there. So we go up to that water tank quite frequently because that's right at the edge of the big woods that starts at that water tank and goes on forever. So we're up there looking around. It was probably maybe midnight, 1230. And we looked over to the side. And sure enough, we saw that cone head kind of rise up between two trees and we, we couldn't get any detail from it but we could just see the cone head and the shoulders and there was that youth grass man watching us which was pretty exciting and then at no time did we feel any need to run or any fear or anything as a matter of fact my buddy he talked to him the whole time while he was doing stuff he said i know you're there talk to him and no, we didn't try to get any pictures of it or anything like that, because if you want to scare them off, that's how you do it. You get a camera and they're gone. You just point a camera at them and it seems like they know that it's something that they don't like for whatever reason, whether they know it's a camera or whether, whatever, but they'll, that's how you scare them off. The same way with trail cams, you put trail cams up, they won't come near, but there is a trick to that also, which we learned, um, which brings me to my, actually, it would have been my first non-visual encounters with the grass man. There is a nature preserve close by. It's actually more in Fairfield County than Hawking County. And this nature preserve is a box canyon. It's about a mile down into it from the parking area, which, you know, it's a privately owned, but folks are allowed in there, but you have to be out at dark. But there's a um, private property adjacent to it that runs into the area of the canyon. And my buddy, he was friends with the guy that lived there originally. And then his son, who inherited the house, this property, believe it or not, has been in his family since the 1700s like early to mid 1700s. And they've been documenting these grass men as they come in every year. And sometimes they'd stay all summer. Sometimes they would come in in the spring and then once again in the summer for a couple of weeks and then they'd leave. And sometimes they stay the whole summer. But his whole family had been documenting these grass men clans coming through and actually, this is going to sound crazy, but they actually do have a language. And these folks pass that language, what they knew from generation to generation, down to the family. So this guy and my buddy were friends because my, my buddy knew his father who lived there before him. And he was he had been going there since he was a little kid. My buddy had. He discovered this place. And I mean, it's gorgeous. There's waterfalls, sheer cliffs, of course, because it's a canyon. There's a natural amphitheater there. And one of the things that 
drug him there besides the waterfalls riding inner tubes off of him after a storm. The other thing was in the guy's house, it still has the original one room cabin with a dirt floor. And one of his ancestors actually used to go down and paint when the Indian tribes would come in and they would get that natural amphitheaters where they would have their meetings with the different tribes. And he actually got permission to go and paint them. So my buddy is looking at the paintings and he's noticing more of where the women would set and do their sewing. And he would take note of that. And then he would go back down with the box and the screen and he would dig around in those spots and actually did find some Indian beads and stuff. We found arrowheads and seeing how it's privately owned, there's no law against doing that. As long as you're not digging up caves and, and you know, digging skeletons or anything like that. But anyway, as he got to know the guy more and more, he would trickle some information to him. And like I said, these things, they're definitely not what people think they are. They're not apes by any means. They are definitely got human in them. The whole time you're down in this canyon, you hear voices. And we always thought maybe it was the wind, but the more it happened, the more we realized it was not the wind and we couldn't understand what they were saying. And it was off in a distance. You know, we would find tracks. We found many tracks down there. We found the big X's up in the trees. One time we found this tree that the only way I can describe it is it was uh, like you had inverted a ear of corn and ate around it with it vertical. And you could see the teeth marks going around this tree. And it started about eight feet up. And then went down to about a foot from the bottom and all the bark was laying around the bottom, but they had got in and was, you could see the teeth marks all the way around this thing. We later found out from the guy who lives there, who knows these beings, he said they were after a spore, a certain kind of spore that was in this tree. And I, I never did find out exactly what kind of tree it was. It, it looked kind of like an ash, but it wasn't because we thought maybe it was after the emerald ash borer. But that wasn't the case. It was after some kind of spore that was in there. And that was really intriguing. And some of the info that we found out from this guy that have, you know, his family had been documenting him and he's still documenting them. And uh, touching back on that language, the only way I can describe the words that I've seen from it that he let us write down out of the journals. We didn't get a lot of info, but we got a little bit. He would let us, you know, see bits and pieces of the journals and he'd let us write stuff down. The words the, with the vowels and the vowel sounds seem to be reminiscent of um, ancient Iroquois. It's the only way I can describe it. I mean, it just, I, I've looked into this a little bit and it, a lot of the same vowel sounds are from that language. I'm not saying that's what it is, but it, it appears closer to that than anything I could find. With that being said, the guy was a wealth of knowledge and he did fill us in on a few things. Uh, one of them being the above ground structures that everybody sees. Then they would go back thinking they was going to find the grass man in these structures during the day sleeping. Well, that's not the case. Those, some of them anyway, are nurseries. That's where they will go in give birth, hang out for a little bit and, you know, have a place out of the wind, out of the rain, all the elements, what have you. And they, they were birthing huts. And as far as the intricate weaving, no, there, there's human in them. So there was no intricate weaving. It may look like that, but what they do is they would drag brush in from another part of the woods and fields and ball it all up together and then just roll it and roll it and roll it. And then once they got it big enough, the big one would go in and just clear it out from inside and make the structure. Now, not all of them were made like that. Some of them were made by stacking tree limbs. We've seen them like that as well. One in particular was pine. And it's almost comical because you see this big pine hut. And if you notice, the pine trees all around it don't have any limbs for clear up almost to the top. They start having limbs again. Just a few. We think to ourselves, yeah, that's not noticeable. 
But um, the whole time we're down in this area, you know, we'd see a shadow here and there. My buddy, he started going down in there looking for the grass men after he had had seen one down there that scared him so bad he sat for five hours in one spot and wouldn't move because he saw it through the ferns. He had seen movement and he had moved the ferns aside and saw this big grass man. He described it. It was the side of it. He could see it from its head down to about its thigh. And he said it was brown in color and had what he describes as a razor back, which kind of like a ridge that went up its back and then up onto the cone of its head. And then the head was cone shaped. And he said it was a man looking, but it wasn't. He called it a man beast. And he said it walked off without making a sound. And he just sat frozen in that space, wondering if it was going to come back around, what was going to happen. And mind you, it's a good mile back up out of there. So after about four or five hours, he finally crawled ever so slightly up the hill until he could see his vehicle. And then he took off. And that was that. So I guess, you know, this was, uh, like I said, he'd been going down there since he was a kid. But he didn't see any of the grass men until he didn't say actually how old he was when he first saw one down there. But he was had obviously grown up and gone to the service and came back. Um, he's an army ranger, so he was he is a pretty tough cookie. He's been shot, blown up, bayoneted, stabbed, you name it. He had the guy's fearless. So for him to be frozen like that says a lot. And like I said, the whole time I've been down there with him, you get the feeling that you're being watched, which we kind of found out later on we knew we were being watched because as luck would have it, my very first trip down there into this canyon with him, we went around the top of the canyon and instead of taking the long way, which has steps, we decided to take the short way, which was around the top of the rim and then straight down in it at an angle. Well, you had to make this little curve at the top and it was a pretty good step down onto a rock that was moss covered. I stepped down onto it. My feet went out from under me. I started over this sheer cliff. He grabs me. Actually saved my life or at least saved me from getting maimed because it was pretty far down into rocks. So that, that was pretty scary. And then the rest of the day we felt like we were being watched and that's when we found some tracks. We found, we would see the big X's. We didn't see any structures yet, but we would see structures, the, the X's up in the trees. And this was before, actually, before I knew that he knew the guy on the property there. This would come along later on. And he started telling me about going down and talking to this guy and getting the journals. And then I got to see some of them and saw the language that they speak and found out that Actually, we were being watched that day by a youth, and believe it or not, it communicates with the guy there at the the house on the property. And when he saw my buddy save me from going over the cliff, the youth was mesmerized by that. He couldn't get that out of his head, I guess, from what this guy was telling us, that he was just really intrigued by that. And he went to his father. And ask him about it, why that happened, because he knew man was the destructive force, the killers. That's what he had always known us as. And then all other than the guy that lives there. And then he sees this and he's gets his wheel spinning. So in the meantime, the guy tells us that his father named us and my name translated was the unbalanced one yeah what a thing to be known by to the grassman community of the you know the grassman themselves is the unbalanced one that's just my luck but we had um went down back down in there later on i think it was the following year we went back down in there and we put up some apples in the trees and we hung a couple of teddy bears up there and then the next day, my buddy gets a call from the guy and says, hey, I need you to come down here. So my buddy goes down here, and um, he shows him this big boulder that was brought up and put in his yard, and then colored rocks were put around it. And he also 
he asked him point blank. He said, do you guys leave anything down there? He said, well, yeah, we left some apples and whatnot down there, you know, some stuffed animals. He goes, well, you got them riled up because I think they were fighting over the apples because it got pretty rambunctious down there last night. And I would suggest probably not going down in there. But what we didn't tell the guy was we had put a trail camera up on top of the rim and we stuffed it up into a hollow log, kind of disguised it up in there. And then we did the trick that he told us to do, which was we wrapped the camera with a blue mylar. He, he said, you have to experiment with the colors. He used amber. We used blue. It was a blue chrome mylar, just what you get in one of those trapper keeper notebooks, you know, the subject themes or whatever, the notebooks you get for high school and college, the big thick ones, and they'll have the um, clear dividers in them, and they're usually chrome blue. Well, we took one of them, and we wrapped the front of that camera with it, taped it up. That way, we could cover the trip beam. I mean, it also, you know, changed the color, not only the trip beam, but it changed the color of the, the photos it took. We set it on photo, which we got a photo of you know, it's not something that you're going to, you know, put out and say, oh, this is definitive proof. No, it was just a picture of its back. We could tell what it was. And um, the guy even told us, you know, later on, when we did tell him that we had gotten that picture and we did have a camera down there. He said, well, that was amazing. He said, Cause I didn't see it. Nobody else, you know, the, the grassman didn't see it. The family didn't see it down there. So we did a good job and he actually commended us for that. I thought that was pretty cool. But to all you out there who want to get a trail cam picture, that's how you do it. You got to hide that camera good where it still gets a good, where it can still take pictures. And you got to change the color of that trip beam. And, and by hiding it, you can also get rid of the sounds, you know, muff the sound out so you don't hear it either. And that's how we did it. And it worked. That's all I can say about that. There was some one incident down there. I didn't get to see this one, but my buddy got to see it where he found a fish trap they had made in the creek where they would, the minis would come in and they would catch fish, nothing real big because there was no big fish in that particular stream, but there were, you know, some pretty good sized chubs and whatnot. And they, I can't remember the details of it, but it was set up in such a way that the uh, fish would come in and they couldn't get out. And they had just made this when he came in to the area. And so he turned and got back out of there because he knew they were nearby, didn't want to disturb them. And we still didn't know what they were capable of to us because we're strangers still, even though they give us names. I would say the name, but it's hard to pronounce. I will actually, I will say mine. It was Yom Tiki U. And my buddy was Hap Chunuk which his meant preserver of life, something to that effect. But that was pretty cool. You know, we got, got names from him. Uh, if somebody would have told me this, you know, 10 years ago, I would have probably laughed and said, yeah, you're nuts. But from what I've seen and gone through with these things and the dog men, nothing anybody can tell me would make me question them. Nothing. Because I've seen some pretty crazy stuff. You know, there are orbs associated with these grass men. A lot of folks know that. A lot of people think it's Huey, but it is fact. I've seen them. They can do the mind speak. I ex haven't really experienced it from the grass men per se, but I have experienced it from dog men. And the fear that everybody talks about, that, that one is a completely different monster. It's hard to describe. It's it's like being in, in your body, but not in your body, because you're telling yourself there's no reason for you to be afraid, but yet you're quaking in your boots. And that's really hard to take sometimes you know, when I think about it, because it was totally out of my control. But that's for another story. Like I said, I don't have a whole lot of detail as far as the grassmen go from what we've seen, other than the callers. You know, they've all been dark. And when we've seen them at dark, they're always going to be dark. So I don't know if they were black, if they were brown. The ones we've seen down in the campgrounds don't know exactly. I think for the most part, they're brownish colored. They were 
dark from where we were seeing them from. We weren't close enough to get, you know, any facial detail or anything like that. What little bit of facial detail we've gotten was from actually from somebody else's photo of the same area that they actually got. It was actually the guy who has the property down there. And the face is just very human. Um, Neanderthal, I guess, you know, no hair on the face, hair all around the face, but Neanderthal looking almost, almost Neanderthal and a little bit of almost like it got a little bit of down syndrome is the look they have. I, I don't think that's the case, but that's just like they, the best way to describe it is a Neanderthal with down syndrome. The ones I've seen the clear pictures of and Oh, yeah. The one thing I did mention was we also learned from the man down there that these things, they live for the most part underground caves. They'll dig the ground out if they have to. They'll do it themselves. Um, he's actually found one of their entrances. And he said, if you're looking for it, you may not find it. He, he got lucky. He said, because what they'll do is they'll have boulders or big tree trunks right there close by that when they go in that hole, they can just pull that right up over it, but, you know, with their incredible strength. And I found that was pretty fascinating, which would explain some of the disappearing in thin air, but it, it doesn't explain the, um, you know, footprints in the middle of a field and the snow just stopping and nothing to be seen. I'm learning more and more about that part of it, what they're capable of, but it's just been in bits and pieces. There's been many a times when we've been in the woods and, and like I said, we knew we were being watched and there was, um, what, well, yeah, I forgot about this one in particular time. We was at the campgrounds and we actually went up into the woods out of the campgrounds, which we can't do that anymore because there's a government facility back there that actually they find you now, if you go beyond a certain point in the woods, it's under the guise of the utility company, but it's not because we know there's a government complex back there where they train newcomers to run the big machines and to work on them, stuff like that. It's a training ground, basically. But we were back close to that one day when we heard just the most ungodliest footsteps, footfalls coming through the woods. And I mean, it sounded like a like a bulldozer coming through the woods, but we could tell it was running. It wasn't a machine. And that's probably the first time they really scared me. That were to where we got out of there too sweet, you know, got on the um, golf cart and as fast as it would go winding down through the trees, which was pretty harrowing itself because of the fact that the roof stuck up. And if you went around the corner too sharp, he's going to catch the tree trunk and flip it. Or maybe worse, you know, hers both. But that that was probably the scariest have been with with the grass man. Most of the time, they they've never really bothered us. Um, we just watch them from a distance. I don't know if they knew where we were up on the deck watching them, but I'm sure they probably had a pretty good idea at one point or another. And like I said, no, they were watching us down at that canyon. But that's about all I can think of off the top of my head that like the experience with them. I mean, I know there's more. I've, I've had way more experience with Dogman than I have Bigfoot or Grassman. And I do want to mention, they do seem to run together. Every once in a while, it sounds like they're working together because they definitely round up coyotes and take coyotes because we've sat and listened to them do that night after night over the last four years. It's unmistakable. You hear the the grass man howl in one spot, then you'll hear it over in another spot, and the coyotes start going off, and then you'll hear that back and forth once or twice more, and then you'll hear a big yelp, and you know they got one. And then you'll hear another yelp. You may hear three or four. Usually it's one or two, but there have been times when we've heard them get three or four. But in the mix of that, we've also heard the dog man yelling or, you know, it's growl, bark, whatever you want to call it, half bark, half growl, where it was actually in the mix up there 
in the woods with them wherever they were at with the coyotes i'm not sure if they were in the woods or in one of the clearings there's some clearings up there really hard to say because we were listening and wasn't about to go up and find out in the middle of the night <laughs> at all then we found tracks down around his cabin from both big colossal grass man tracks he actually was talking to me on the phone one time up at the water tank and saw one walk behind this cabin and we went back there and looked in this cabin the roof was every bit of 15 foot up there it had to be to the top and this thing you could see it over the top of the ridge line i mean i i, I hate to say this but he did take a photo of it with his flip phone and when i blew it up it was actually a grass man carrying a hog that it stole down the road there was eight of them missing down there about a half a mile down the road and they were all 300 400 pound range and this guy had it up on his shoulder like it was nothing so that was pretty amazing but that's about all i got so hopefully folks will learn something from it i try to share everything i can that i know which like i said with the the huts the above ground structures and as far as getting them on trail cam, how to do that, the language. A lot of this came from the journals that we were privy to that were just outstanding, but they'll never see the light of day. I know that for a fact. This guy's pretty secretive about him and pretty protective. They'll never come out in the public, at least not in any time soon, maybe sometime in the future. Who knows if they actually get discovered? I do that with air quotes. I say that if they do actually get brought to light, then maybe that would be the time when the journals get shared. That would be awesome. But uh, that's all I got. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down no-horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies grooving With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing and I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah